The pink ribbon to me symbolizes solidarity. It symbolizes the universality of women and men. We think of hope and life and family and growing old together. I think about my sisters who are all fighting this battle. I think of me, like I survived. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Check one, two, this is a test. Still is, still is, still is. Check one, two, this is a test. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, walkers and runners. Welcome to the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure. Our opening ceremonies will begin in just 15 minutes. All runners, please make your way to the runner's start at Madison and 7. Walkers will start the race from the main stage area. All survivors who wish to participate in the Survivor Parade, please make your way to the Survivor Check-in Tent at this time. Once again, our opening ceremonies will begin in just 15 minutes. When I was being treated for breast cancer in 2000 and 2001, I, I did a strange thing. I, I wasn't, did not research the science. I became fascinated more by this breast cancer culture that I was encountering on the internet and in other forms at that time. So I became more, I turned sort of into an anthropologist and think, what's going on here? You know, what? what is it with all these pink ribbons and everything? an epidemic that goes unnoticed except for those who grieve and for those who live in fear. found sisterhood from other women and looking critically at what was going on with our health care. The sisterhood now is supposed to be supplied by the, the runs and races for the cure. I mean, what a change. We used to march in the streets. Now you're supposed to run for a cure or walk for a cure or jump for a cure or whatever it is. Uh, so I think the effect of the whole pink ribbon culture was to drain and deflect the kind of militancy we had as women who were appalled to have uh, a disease that is epidemic and yet that we don't even know the cause of. There are a lot of people, I've heard many people say, well, anger, not helpful. Actually, anger is helpful depending on what you do with it. And I think if people actually knew what was happening, they would be really pissed off. They should be.
women die from breast cancer just because they're women, right? We don't know what lifestyle or what it is that make women get breast cancer. The most important risk factor for breast cancer is being a woman. Excessive government spending, taxing and regulating, no matter how well intended, is a formula for disaster. Volunteer activities and philanthropy play a role as well as economic incentives and investment opportunities. To be certain, we're talking about America's deep spirit of generosity. But we're also talking about a buck for business if it helps to solve our social ills. With the same energy that Franklin Roosevelt sought government solutions to problems, we will seek private solutions. Well, certainly philanthropy has for over 100 years played a central part in American culture, but it wasn't until Reagan came to power that we saw explicit policies designed to shift responsibility away from health and welfare from the government towards private entities, philanthropic organizations, and the encouragement specifically of corporations to participate in that. As you can see behind me, we handed out about 12,000 bottles of honest tea and honest aid today. We introduced our new flavor, our organic half-and-half -half iced tea, which is half black tea, half lemonade, into the, uh, into the trade. And what better way to kick it off than handing it out to 55,000 thirsty men and women? You know, cause marketing is a phenomenon uh, unique, I think, to capitalism, where a company decides that if they just associate with the cause people care about, the buyers care about, they will increase their sales. That's about the bottom line. Now, I think there are, within those companies, people who care deeply about what the issue is, but breast cancer is the poster child of cause marketing. There's more of it for breast cancer than any other disease, and I think it's partly because it's about breast cancer and women make most of the buying decisions, and we get to say breast out loud on public television. You don't have to look far to find products in pink on store shelves. You know, if one had benefits going towards any kind of charity, I'd, I'd probably choose that one or if it was similar in price, and I knew it was going for a good cause. I keep thinking that we're going to reach saturation point. Certainly when I began researching the book in 1998, I could not have imagined that women would be able to buy products ranging from handguns to gasoline in the name of raising money for breast cancer. Come in, Miss Kane. Sit down. Thank you. I've been reading the laboratory report again. I... Miss Kane, you require immediate surgery. You have cancer. Uh, well, all right. Now, I think we have an opportunity for some pictorial comment here. Diana, you've just been handed the most startling news of your life. You have cancer. Now, anyone who has faced this moment knows that it is a serious, frightening time. Play this as if you are tongue-tied for a moment, you see? All right. Charlie, uh, take a tight close-up of her face. We want to see her reaction to this news. Uh, start the action again, Doctor. It means we have to operate to remove the breast. There must be some other way. There are only two ways to cure cancer. Surgery and irradiation, Miss Kane. 
means I'll be permanently disfigured, doesn't it? I stopped working as a surgeon in about 1998. Um, I did it for 20 years, and I found that we really hadn't made that much progress. We were still doing surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, you know, maybe slightly different. We weren't doing as much surgery, and maybe we were doing more chemotherapy than when I started. But really, we were still doing the same things, what I've been known to call slash, burn, and poison, which are very crude ways of dealing with a disease. You know, that's what you do when you don't understand it. And I really felt like I needed to get more involved in figuring out how to stop it. are thrilled that uh, we have been lighting monuments all over the world and this year 200 monuments will have been lit um, for breast cancer awareness so if you see a pink monument that's lit that should give you a reminder along with the pink ribbon which um, will remind uh, everyone to take care of their breast health Connect, communicate, conquer. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you all for joining us. It's great to be here tonight. It's our wonderful way to highlight Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Our message is simple. Be vigilant and get regular mammograms. It can save your life. Tell your mothers, tell your sisters, tell your daughters. Connect, communicate, and conquer. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. I think that what this ties into is the very warm and fuzzy sort of sentimentality around pink, which is, is supposed to be a comforting thing rather than something that is jarring to people. Um, my question would be, what does raising um, or lighting up Niagara Falls for 24 hours in pink really do to affect change? It's a great thing that women are more aware, but awareness is different from doing something about it. So behavior change, you know, you could be aware of your risk. I, I'm sure everyone has heard that women can get breast cancer, but does every woman think they are likely to get breast cancer? No, everyone always thinks, oh, it's the other woman that's gonna get breast cancer, not me. There are many people to this day who believe that if they get a mammogram, they won't get breast cancer. They, they end up with breast cancer and say, but I got my mammograms, how can I have breast cancer? That's because we gave them the wrong message. It's the wrong message. It's that simple. So then it became early detection is your best protection against what? Early detection, put simply, works for some. You find some cancers early enough, they're treatable, they get those treatments, they live a long life. 
For some people, early detection just means we're finding something that will never be life-threatening, and we treat them anyway, and they get sick from the treatment. And for some people, early detection means you have a kind of cancer that's so aggressive that our currently available treatments cannot help you. It doesn't matter when we find it. That's not hard to understand, but people don't like that message. Everybody wants to think they're in the first group. My name is Rosemary Parker, and i am uh, been a member of the Ivy League Breast Cancer Support Group for a year. Uh, I've been diagnosed with a metastatic four stage a year and a half ago. I'm Sandy Kugelman, and um, I was originally diagnosed in 2001 with stage two breast cancer, and um, tried to do all the right things to never allow it to come back into my life again. And I thought that I had um, beaten it, as they say. And then in 2004, um, was re-diagnosed with stage four. And when you're stage four, it means that um, the disease has spread to some other part outside of the breast. Um, it's also known as metastasis. And the only thing that I ever knew about stage four um, was that you die when you get stage four, that that's the stage before you die. There's no stage five. There are very few of these groups in the United States. There are extremely few stage four groups. And, and that's just a tragedy because you go to a regular breast cancer support group and you're the angel of death. You know, you're the, you're the elephant in the room. And they're, they're, they're learning to live and you're learning to die. It is my true honor to introduce you to the amazing breast cancer survivors of the Avon Walk for Breast Cancer San Francisco. As much as I know that uh, people have, many people who are, you know, really do have good intentions with a pink ribbon. However, maybe that's all they're seeing is a pink ribbon. I want them to see the faces. I want them to see women. I want them to see lives. I want them to see people that are, are hurting and people that are living with stage four breast cancer. You know, we're living, we're human beings. We're not just a little pink ribbon. Women and men whose bravery has no limits. Our mothers, our daughters, our wives and husbands, our sisters, and our friends who have fought this disease. Since our inception, we have donated to this cause, to this mission, over a billion and a half dollars. Well over 600 million of it has gone to basic and clinical research. And at any one time, we will have hundreds of millions of dollars in grants uh, that, that are active and that are carefully, carefully looked at by um, teams of what we believe to be the best scientists in the U.S., patient advocates, and of course our board in the end looks first at our priorities and tries to understand what's happening in the world and the science of cancer and breast cancer. So the Avon Foundation for Women is a public charity now. It was founded in 1955 and it was the, uh, at that time the corporate affiliated foundation for Avon products. And today the Avon Foundation is an independent public charity in the United States and it raises money through the Avon Walks for Breast Cancer, through the sale of Pink Ribbon products that Avon, the company, manufactures each year, like the pin that I'm wearing, and also through general donations from the public. I believe that there is a sisterhood that has been created around breast cancer, and I believe it was done by two entities very much so. Komen, 
the Susan G. Komen Foundation for the Cure, as well as Avon. The two of them were so powerful in touching so many lives in so many ways. I believe they created this momentum that then other companies decided there is this cause, there has been this positive way of creating a relationship. Perhaps that's something I should get engaged in as well. <laughs> We had a little coalition called the Toxic Links Coalition in the Bay Area, which um, of which I was a founding member. And one of the things we used to do every single October was to hold what we called a cancer industry tour in which we visited the headquarters of some of the worst polluters in the downtown financial district. We have never in all of years taken a stand on any environmental issues, despite the overwhelming evidence the cancer and a whole host of other diseases is caused by viral pollution. Red, blue, show, show. Boys and got to go. In, in response to the question that people often ask is why do we put, are we putting a pretty pink face on this? Absolutely, categorically not. Because when you, when you lead from only anger, you do not include or incent people to be part of a mission. If people feel there is no hope, they will not participate long term. They will feel they're in an endless fight. If we look back through history from anti-colonial movements to the civil rights movement to the feminist movement, people were able to quite nicely combine anger with pride and optimism. What has happened with the mainstream breast cancer organizations is that they have tied themselves so closely to corporations that they have to sell the disease in a particular way and they feel that if they don't do that, that they'll alienate customers or their potential audience. It'll be $21.44. We got four different flavors. We got strawberry banana, strawberry mango pineapple, and blueberry pomegranate. Coming at you, blueberry pomegranate. And it tastes delicious. Everybody's loving it. You can try it if you want. A company like a Yoplait or a company like Avon needs to again find an innovative way to tie to the cause and year over year over year commit to certain things like Yoplait. Take the lid clean the lid, put it in an envelope, and send it back. And they do it with deep, deep, genuine authenticity every single year. So you take the top off the Yoplait container, you clean it off, presumably, you put it in an envelope, you put a stamp, now 45 cents in the US, um, and you send it to the company. And for every top you send in, it's, they give 10 cents. If you ate three cups of Yoplait every day for the four months of the campaign, September and December, and sent in every lid, your total donation would be $34. Really, write a check. <laughs> My favorite example of this is actually American Express, which in 2002 had a campaign in, in the fight against breast cancer, every dollar counts. 
I would like to come back to the question of the language we use about fight, but okay, in the fight against breast cancer, every dollar counts. And then you read the fine print. And the fine print says, for every purchase made between September and December at participating stores with your American Express card, the company would give one penny per purchase. If you bought a $1,000 coat, a penny. If you bought a $10 item, a penny. So while every dollar counts, it was only a penny they were giving. You know, some things are like bacteria that exposed to sunlight disappear. So we exposed that campaign in 2002 and they stopped it. The National Football League was in the midst of what was called a character crisis where several of their players had been in trouble with the law and they were looking for ways to rehabilitate their image. At the same time, they had discovered that women actually made up a much larger percentage of their viewership than they had previously realized. And so they were interested in maintaining and extending their female audience. One of the things that we've seen with the emergence of the pink ribbon industry is the construction of breast cancer as a disease that primarily affects middle-class, ultra-feminine white women. And this, of course, has to do with the fact that corporations are trying to sell products. They're trying to sell products to a particular and preferred demographic. And this is the kind of image that they think will move those products. The cause, if done right over time, can create a glue and a word of mouth that no promotion or no advertising could ever afford to create. Hi, this is Kitty Van Bortel. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, all I wanted to do was to get into a Ford Mustang convertible and go. I want to give another woman that same opportunity. Are you a breast cancer survivor? If so, please visit Van Bortel Ford today or online at VanBortelFord.com for your chance to win a brand new 2008 Mustang convertible. You combine the passion behind a Mustang with the passion behind this cause, the breast cancer cause, and you put the two of them together and it's a bit of an explosion. Every battle needs a leader that's 100% committed to the cause. Every warrior needs great gear. Several years ago, um, after we had been involved with Coleman for a long time, we developed the Warriors in Pink campaign and wanted to drive deeper and make a bigger connection and a bigger impact. And uh, one of the things we um, decided after talking with a lot of breast cancer survivors, those going through the battle and their loved ones that there was a need for some sort of symbolism to represent the journey they're going through. And so we came up with um, 12 symbols of a warrior. A warrior being someone who's fighting breast cancer or someone who's helping someone fight breast cancer. When I was going through chemotherapy, I was um, completely baffled by the language that said I was battling a disease. I wasn't battling anything. I was forcing myself to comply with the treatments that were recommended. I was showing up for the chemotherapy sessions. Is that a battle? The message there is that if you try hard enough, you put forth the effort, if you just do it, mm -hmm. if you live strong maybe even, I don't know, um, you can beat it, you can, you can do it. So just try really hard. And the problem with that message is that you can't have that message and then not see people who die as somehow not having lost. They lost their battle because why? 
They didn't maybe try hard enough. They just weren't trying hard enough. And I don't know that people really think that through, but it's a very clear message that we are aware of so much. I particularly reject the word survivor as a label for myself, uh, not only because I'm a little superstitious and who knows, you know, but also because it seemed seems to me to be a put down of those women who don't survive. Public meetings arranged by leaders in the war against cancer are being held throughout the country under the auspices of the Women's Field Army of the American Society for the Control of Cancer. Through these meetings and by other educational efforts, the truth about cancer is presented to the people. And the truth is, cancer is curable when taken in time. The Women's Field Army uh, was one of the first national efforts to really begin to batter these militaristic metaphors to death. They had their own uniforms with uh, sashes going across and badges. We're mobilizing against an enemy which requires all of our cunning, all of our might, and without this bellicose approach, we're not going to conquer this enemy. So for somebody to have, to be faced with that kind of message, the most fragile and vulnerable amongst the cancer community, people who are, who are really in the process of leaving, to be faced with that kind of painful messaging, it's wrong, it's just wrong. And I don't know any other way to say it. And it's, there is this hard thing because there's this balance between hope and having the, the energy to go through treatment that is potentially very difficult. And on the other side, understanding that it may not work. And at that point, what do you do? That there's that reality, that we don't deny that, that there's that possibility. And that it's not a failure, it's not a failure. You can die in a perfectly healed state. And I think that that's what we're forgetting. It's up to each of you to take care of yourselves and one another this weekend. Don't forget the taking care of each other part. You'll get out of this weekend what you put into it. Remember to keep smiling because it's contagious. We do use a lot of upbeat music and we try to use a lot of words like inspiring and, and hope um, because that's what we're doing. You know, the, re the fact that all these thousands of people are here is, is a pretty incredible statement about a disease that they want to see end. I speak to a lot of breast cancer survivors and I write their stories and help them get up on stage and tell them. And while many of the same thread goes through a lot of the stories, everybody has a different story. And our, our survivor this, this uh, weekend is 24 years old. Good morning. I'm walking my first Avon walk because I want to share my story of survival and to remind you that you're never too young to get breast cancer. A year ago, I was a 23-year-old single mom who thought that cancer was the least of my worries. But even with no family history, I found a lump that turned out to be breast cancer. So I've come to walk to support the other young survivors out there, to help build a better future for my son Gianni, and to begin to give back for all of the loving support I got from my family and friends. My name is Marissa Castoro from San Francisco, California, and I am a one-year breast cancer survivor. I'm in it to end it for me. A minute to end it for me and for every other person battling breast cancer, young and old, across the country and around the world. Good morning, Walkers! Your commitment and hard work have really paid off. Because as of today, the Walkers and crew of the Avon Walk San Francisco have already raised more than an amazing $5.5 million.
I really didn't, really didn't want to even talk about uh, dying. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to think about it. And, but I realized it was there. It was always there, the thoughts. And, um, and I realized one of the reasons I didn't want to die was because I was told, you're, you know, I wasn't given any time when I was diagnosed. And I was diagnosed last year with stage four uh, breast cancer. Prior to that, in 06, I was diagnosed with stage one. So when it came back, it came back very strong. And it came back in my liver and my bones. And, and when it did come back, it just progressed so quickly that they couldn't give me a, a date of how long I could live. I was raised in a very religious um, family. And I did, I went, oh my God, is God punishing me? And then, you know, I can help, but I don't know why, but it did occur to me. And then of course I realized, you've never believed that kind of bullshit anyway. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the God you've always believed in is a loving God and a loving God would never set out to hurt you. Every year I hate to raise the, the funds, but as I get going doing it, and then this morning, you know, I, we got up and got going and I just said, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready. We've been preparing for nine months for this, so we had no idea what to expect and just everybody around and everybody supporting us is just a really, really, really great feeling. Our team is Tickle Pink for Cure and today I'm walking for one of my friends who is a survivor and she's also been diagnosed again, so she's currently going through chemo a second time. When a family member is diagnosed with breast cancer, you feel hopeless and you feel like you want to do something. It's either, uh, you know, driving them to appointments or doing this walk. Just, just a small part to lessen their pain and suffering. In the waiting room of the radiologist, you know, at the place where you get the mammograms, and this was a second mammogram. Uh, it went on for about an hour and a half because the radiologist would keep asking for more angles or something. And I ran out of my other reading material, started reading the local weekly newspaper all the way down to the classified advertisements. And there was an advertisement for a pink breast cancer teddy bear. I can't tell you how much this offended my sense of dignity. Here I am, you know, uh, at the time, middle-aged woman, facing the most serious health crisis of my life, facing my own mortality, and somebody's offering me a pink teddy bear? I'm sorry, I'm not six years old. I rode my bicycle past your window last night.
there may be more a pressure on breast cancer patients uh, to be positive simply because there's more pressure on women in general to be smiling and helpful and perky and cheerful at all times. What I found in my research is that many women actually feel alienated by the overly optimistic approach. They feel like they can't have their feelings of anger or despair or hopelessness and feel like a legitimate person with breast cancer, that in order to be a survivor, you must maintain this optimistic outlook and participate in what I call the tyranny of cheerfulness. and they've been walking since 6.30 this morning, and these hard candies will help them to have their blood sugar to be elevated, and also it'll help keep their mouth moist, because that's the biggest problem you have at this point. And they need to keep their hands in the air because their hands start swelling. It's incredibly difficult. Actually, tomorrow's gonna be even more difficult. Today's a longer distance, but tomorrow they're gonna be going up hills, 13 miles of hills, and if you know San Francisco, some of them are very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I love San Francisco. I don't want to be a Grinch <laughs> and discourage people from running or racing. I'm all into fitness and everything like that. But uh, I, I wish that they could also hear from all the women who uh, have been through breast cancer and resent the effort to make it pretty and feminine and normal. It's not normal. It's horrible. It has to be stopped. We really have softened the disease. Um, we have a lot of people who are survivors, and that also helps to make it feel like it's a, you know, a triumph or as opposed to something we should be angry about. And I think the time is to re-politicize it. And the re-politicizing it is pointing out to people that they don't know where this research money is going. I mean, if somebody really is concerned about environmental causes of breast cancer, and there are a lot of people who are, then they should make sure that the money they're raising is going to that kind of research. You know, if, if you want to find out what the cause is and not have your kid get it, then you want to make sure. But we have to learn as women to ask questions, not just raise the money and hand it over and then never know what happens to it. This is extremely puzzling to me that so little has come from any of this research that all of these uh, organizations that brag about giving money to research, instead of saying what has come out of this investment, they tell you how much money they've put into it. So they, they say, you know, last year we gave 15 million to breast cancer research, or in the case of Komen, I think it's really huge, like 450 million, something like that. But they um, have, to my mind, very little to show for it, and very little that goes beyond the status quo. I hope the future is to find a cure very soon. I hope that they find a cure so that my grandchildren won't have to go through what we've gone through. That they'll find a cure for it, but I don't know if they're going to find one, you know, but if it's God's will, they'll find it, you know. Find a cure. Please find a cure. Cheers to the cure. Cheers to the cure. Cheers to the cure. I think that the public isn't critical, even if they maybe do know, because so much is invested in pharmaceutical treatments. So we think that a cure is the answer. And if we think that a cure is the answer, we're not actually gonna have a very critical perspective on pharmaceutical company work in the area. They go with the flow, and the flow is toward looking at research that will have a marketable product at the end, something which can improve survival by three weeks, 
but which can be very profitable for the promoters for the period in which they enjoy that slight edge because of this slight uh, improvement in survival. They do not seem to be interested in prevention, but this is how capitalism works. They're looking for markets and expanding their markets, and their understanding of how this works would be to medicalize American women. I want prevention. And our federal government, of all the funds it allocates to cancer research each year, gives between 3 and 5% to prevention. And if you ask people, medical people, scientists, politicians, corporate people, if you raise the issue of prevention, they will say, well, we can't prevent it when we don't know what causes it. Well, how the hell can you cure what you don't know? Well, now we're starting to have a lot of observations that say cancer is more complex, that there are five or six different kinds of breast cancers, and that how they behave and how they act is not just a matter of the cell slowly growing and taking over. I mean, we've really thought about cancer as if it were a foreign invader. The cell comes from somewhere else, it comes, it attacks, you know, it's like a terrorist, right? And we have to kill it. We have to blast it away. We have to slash, burn, and poison everything we can do to get rid of it. But actually, it's not from outside. It's one of our own cells that goes bad. You know, I say in, in the United States, it's not Osama bin Laden, it's Timothy McVeigh. It's our own terrorists that we grew ourselves. And so we don't want to, it's not the same as just blasting it out. We have to figure out why we grew that terrorist, what neighborhood, what was it that really egged it on and fostered it? More than half of the women diagnosed with breast cancer don't have one of the major risk factors that we know about for breast cancer. So what is it that made them develop breast cancer? And right now, most of the research is not targeted at answering those questions. We at the California Breast Cancer Research Program are trying hard to identify, to examine possible environmental links to breast cancer. And uh, we hope that that will result in finding answers for that other 50% of women. Uh, but we are a, a, a kind of lone voice and there is a, the majority of breast cancer research is not focused in that direction. I think we're ingesting plastic. Um, we cook in it, we live in it. Um, the seafood is eating it in the ocean and we're eating the seafood. It's just, it's become part of our, our food chain. And I think that um, before all of these plastics, people didn't have breast cancer like this or other kinds of cancer. And I, I'm just convinced that there's, that there's a link. No, we know that only about 20 or 30% of breast cancer happens in women with risk factors. If we can only explain 20 to 30% of breast cancer, then we don't know what causes it. We're missing something big. And if we keep looking at the same risk factors over and over again, we're not gonna figure it out. We need to broaden, we need to look at new things. We need, could be a virus. Wouldn't surprise me a bit if breast cancer wasn't caused by a virus. It could be something we haven't even thought of yet. And we really have to be creative and we have to really take on the challenge of finding the cause and stopping it.
Hi, my name is Dao Tran. I um, came from Vietnam and live in New York City for 29 years. Um, I diagnosed with breast cancer in 2005 and did all the treatments and everything and finished and went back to work. I thought I'm done, but last year I found out I just had my cancer came back. And according to where they came back, I become a state four. At first, I thought state four is just like a, a number. I, I didn't know state four is the final stage. And I, I, I didn't know that um, it's not cure. And then I went to a doctor. And the doctor told me it's no cure. So, I don't believe it. So I, I went for a second opinion. I went to MD Anderson. And they tell me the same thing. <laughs> they tell me the same thing. They say, this case has no cure. So I, I ask him, so how many years do I have left? He goes, we don't know. It depends on a person. Each person is different. Um, so what I do if I don't choose to do any treatment? He go, then you may not live that long. I go, but isn't that you die anyway, even you get treatment? You know, all those poison will kill you. And they say, oh, but they keep your life longer. And I ask him, oh, are you telling me that I'm going to live on drugs for the rest of my life? And he said, kind of. And I go, OK, I see. So what if you get drugs and then you're being so sick? What kind of life are you living? So he's, he's, he told me that whether well, there are several drugs out there, some of them may get you very sick, but some of them are not. So it depends on your body, how your body responds to it. And I go, OK, why don't you pick me the minus drug that I can handle it and I can live my life until the day I couldn't take it anymore. I twist my ankle going down the hill. Lots yeah. of hills in San Francisco. <laughs> so do you think you can continue tomorrow? Yes, yes, yes. I'll keep my um, leg elevated tonight Actually, and ice, put ice on it. Definitely. Yes. Is that comfortable? Not yes, too it tight? Is. Feels great. Right. Yes. All right. Yes, I'm walking um, because my mom uh, died of cancer. Um, so I'm walking for my mom, my grandmother, and my great grandmother. They all died of cancer. Yeah. You all alone? No, my daughter is right behind me. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> you know so much. Woo! 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 I'm fighting for breast cancer. For my grandma, my great grandma, and all those involved.
do a lot of work on the safety of personal care products. We have a big database online called Skin Deep. We show safety reviews for 50,000 personal care products. What we find in that research is that many of these products contain chemicals linked to cancer and other kinds of health problems. Right now, we have federal standards in place that don't protect public health. And that includes everything from cosmetics, where there's no safety standard at all in federal law, to the broader world of industrial chemicals, where companies can bring new chemicals onto the market and into consumer products with no requirement in federal law to conduct even a single health and safety test. It's really hard to tell what companies are doing individually to assess the safety of their products. Um, Revlon, Procter & Gamble, Avon, the, aren't making their basic safety studies public, aren't making their risk assessments public. It is my firm belief that Avon products are safe, that they have been safe for a 124-year history of the company, and that product safety is one of Avon's key concerns. The average woman in the U.S. uses about 12 personal care products daily. The average man, about six. Each product containing a dozen or more chemicals. Less than 20% of chemicals and cosmetics have been assessed for safety by the industry's safety panel. So we just don't know what they do to us when we use them. Would you fly in an airline that only inspects 20% of its planes? It turns out the important decisions don't happen when I choose to take a product off the shelf. They happen when companies and governments decide what products should go on the shelves. So who are these companies? Ooh, here's Estee Lauder offering me a chance to help find a cure for breast cancer. That's nice. But wait, they're also using chemicals linked to cancer. It is hypocrisy to use carcinogens in products and at the same time be um, advocating for a cure, raising money for a cure in other ways. It really, companies need to um, be in harmony across all their operations when it comes to their cancer activism. Evelyn Lauder, Estee Lauder's um, daughter-in-law, has designed a lipstick set, as indeed have I. And inside each one, there's a lipstick, a lip pencil, and a lip gloss. And we also have beautiful jewel pins, like this one. The first ribbon for breast cancer was not pink. It was sort of salmon-colored, sort of orange, made by a woman named Charlotte Haley. And Charlotte had lost a lot of people in her family to breast cancer. She saw was what was happening in AIDS. She came up with this ribbon. She put, they were made of cloth. They weren't diamond, they weren't platinum, they were made of cloth. And she put five of them on a card on which she wrote, did you know that less than 5% of the National Cancer Institute's budget goes to cancer prevention? You can change this right to the NCI. And there it is. That's one of the first cards. Can you read us what is written? Yes. Breast Cancer Awareness Ribbon. Join this grassroots movement. Help us to wake up our legislators and America by wearing this ribbon. In the meantime, Estee Lauder, the cosmetics company, and Self Magazine came to her and said, we love your ribbon and we love women and we want to make this the symbol of breast cancer. And Charlotte very quickly said, no, that's about your bottom line. That's not about women's lives. You can't use my ribbon. They said, well, all we have to do if we want it is to change the ribbon. Now, these companies had lawyers, so they ran to the lawyers, what are we going to do? And the lawyers said, find another color. So they convened focus groups of women, only women, and they asked them for the color or colors most comforting, reassuring, non-threatening. Everything a breast cancer diagnosis is not. The color was pink. The 
we are a nation which likes a quick fix. We always have. Uh, and the pink ribbon is clearly a quick fix. We are a nation which, which has swallowed the, again, I think mythology that research is the key without ever questioning what that research is. And when they come and say, you will support breast cancer research if you do thus, we say, oh yes, you know, there's the quick fix. Many things help prevent breast cancer. One of them is to stop smoking. A second one is to stay lean and not to be overweight. To do exercise and to um, really um, have a healthy lifestyle. You know, if I tell you now that you need to eat fewer calories and reduce your cholesterol to lower your risk of dying from heart disease, I think most people would say, yes, I can do that. I can measure my cholesterol and I can take, even take medicine to lower it. And we see that the mortality from heart disease is declining. Well, we can't say that about breast cancer because we just haven't done the research to tell us exactly what to do. And now we're beginning to know that breast cancer is not even one disease, right? It affects young women differently. It affects older women differently. There's estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. There's... So until we do fundamental research to find out what's propelling breast cancer, we can't begin to legislate what to do to prevent it. I, I do not eat sweet. I eat only vegetable and fruit. I eat very little meat. I don't drink coffee, I don't drink soda, I don't drink alcohol, and I'm very mad at myself at how I get cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Not only does it divert us from looking at what's outside of our control, but it also suggests that it's our problem. It's not somebody else's problem. It's not the problem of how we structure things in this society, and that's bad. And we say that every time. Don't blame, and don't give people the tools to blame themselves. Poor women can't go into the supermarket and buy lean meat for their, them and their kids. They just can't. At, at what, $20 a pound or something? I mean, give me a break. The answer is not to try and tell them they should go organic or they should go vegetarian or they should buy this and not this. The answer is get the stuff out of the product that we are ingesting every day because that's how we survive as human beings. Last summer, uh, to summer 2010, we started seeing things posted on B Breast Cancer Action's Facebook page about a KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken campaign with Komen. First we knew that it was going on and the bloggers in nutrition were going nuts. They were like, what? We're gonna sell this really terrible food and raise money for what? What are we gonna do? Well. We're activists, we know what to do. So we got the email addresses of the head of KFC, and the head of Coleman, and the people in charge of marketing Coleman, and we sent, a, sent an email to our base, which is about 15,000 email addresses. Uh, the headline, What the Clock? If you don't like this campaign, tell them you don't like it, and tell them why. And people, uh, by the thousands, actually did that. The Kentucky Fried Chicken campaign suggested to me that the Cohen Foundation has really lost sight of its vision, which is to see a world without breast cancer, and that the bottom line and raising money 
has become the priority regardless of the consequences or how that money is raised. And what was so astonishing about Komen doing this was because Komen has done a lot of work in poor communities. So the disconnect was just shocking. Our grassroots and our member of Susan G. Komen and, you know, the general population lines up with a lot of the customer base of many, many private sector companies all over the world, frankly, were often asked to do programs. And in this case, um, the restaurant company uh, came to us and asked us to um, do a program where they were introducing a grilled product, where we felt that was a very good thing because the fact is, um, again, uh, training people how to eat right and, and doing those sorts of um, um, educational programs don't happen overnight. For Carol. For my wife. For my mom. For every pink bucket of grilled or original recipe, KFC makes a 50 cent contribution to Susan G. Komen for the cure. Together, we could make the largest donation in Komen history to help end breast cancer forever. For the last 30 years, Margaret and I have been working in the area of occupational and environmental health. Currently, we're looking specifically at breast cancer and the impact that environmental and occupational exposures have on the risk of women developing this disease. A very little of this resources is going after the issues around pesticides, around combustion products, around plastics and petrochemicals and solvents. Many of the things that really millions of women are being exposed to every day, either in the general ambient environment or in their workplaces. That there hasn't been work done in that area. The reason I think that the Comans, the whole, the Pink Ribbon Battalions, the whole schmear of them, don't work with environmental justice groups is that environmental justice groups stand in pretty direct opposition to where the money comes from. They can't go there. They just can't because it undermines their people to, to actually insist that we have clean air. I mean, if you insist we have clean air, what do you do about your partnership with Ford? I think there's a lot of uh, criticism out there um, with respect to a lot of environmental factors. Komen is working hard to identify what, what environmental factors are real and what are, what are people taking liberties with. Um, you know, plastics was one that w there was a lot of uh, uproar over that recently. There was a study of General Motors workers where they found an elevated breast cancer risk among women exposed to soluble metalworking fluids, where they think that, again, that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, were involved. So there's a whole host of occupations within the broad auto industry in which many women and men are exposed to substances that are, are toxic and are endocrine disruptors. Barb Wimbush is the Union Safety Rep at Binder Tool and Molds Promo Plastics Division, a company that processes plastic materials. During the molding process, gases are given off. But the gases given off during the normal operations aren't the worst of it. The fumes and smoke can almost be unbearable during a process called purging. These are just um, screenshots from a documentary that was done in 1980, I believe. We've interviewed over a thousand women with breast cancer and 1,150 community controls who don't have breast cancer. And we, we've got their full occupational histories. And what we're trying to do is to compare these two groups to see if there are differences between the women who develop cancer and the women who don't. When I started there back then, like material, safety training was not mandatory. We didn't really have data sheets. We didn't know what we were being exposed to. And depending on the type of plastic you were using, some of those purgings would burn like fluorescent colors. They would burn for hours, just putting all kinds of obnoxious smoke off. And with the fans blowing, what was supposed to be cooling you off was blowing the smoke onto you, and then it would go to the machine next to you. Then we brought it to another machine, stuck the clear piece in, and then it molded it around the, molded, molded all this. Who, who Brings back old days. For? They went, what? Four Fords. Fords. Yeah. Ford Marquis. We did a lot of lenses. We've had probably 12 people that have passed away from cancer. Um, there's a couple of them that had breast cancer. The others, they were full of cancer, so it was hard to determine. I mean, we didn't know exactly if they had breast cancer or not. How old were you when you developed breast 
41. <coughs> 41 years old, yeah. You know, you run into people now and they say, oh, did you hear about Linda? Linda died of breast cancer. Oh, did you hear about Linda's mother? Linda's mother died of breast cancer. Both of them I worked with for 17 years. Uh, Linda being in her 40s, um, young children at home and her mother. And then I run into others, oh, did you hear about Chris? Chris passed away, cancer. I don't know about breast cancer, but cancer. And it's really disheartening when you hear that now and you wish you would have known back then what we were dealing with and did it actually cause it? Was it a contributor? And I certainly hope we find that out before more people get stuck. Almost all the plastics that you were using were, are estrogenic. They mimic the hormone estrogen. This is what these chemicals are. And I, I think, you know, Sandy, you're very active in the breast cancer issue, so you know that it's almost impossible to have breast cancer in the absence of estrogen, right? I, I this, you know, this is the first time I've ever, ever heard that they're finding that the plastics are mimicking the female hormones, and I think that needs to be put out loud and clear because I don't believe there's w all the women out there that's ever worked in the plastics industry ever knew that because this is the no. first for me. Yeah. Yeah. Telling yeah. you. And it's like, that should be out there. These are evidence. I mean, this is, you know, strong evidence. So you've got the animal studies, what we know about endocrine disruption, the human health studies that have been finding these associations. So to say there's no evidence, I, I, I mean, th there may be a question in some people's mind, well, how strong is it? But I think if you apply the precautionary principle to what we're talking here, that we're actually engaged in this process to save people's lives, then I think the evidence is overwhelming. Many of the big players in the cancer establishment in the United States and in Canada have boards of directors that are filled with representatives from the pharmaceutical, chemical, and energy industries. So it's in fact very hard to separate the, the people who might be responsible for the perpetuation of the dis this disease from those who are responsible for trying to find a way to cure it or even better to prevent it. So there are categories of pink washers, cosmetics companies, uh, p companies that make cars, um, some companies make food, dairy in particular, and alcohol, because alcohol is linked to breast cancer. In the dairy field, the problem is largely with companies that stimulate their dairy with recombinant bovine growth hormone, which has been linked to breast cancer. If you're a company doing a pink campaign that uses RBGH, you're a pink washer. And Yoplait, made by General Mills, what is the, was the biggest offender. They raised millions of dollars for the Coleman Foundation selling this yogurt that has in it dairy stimulated with RBGH. So in what year is this, 2000? In 2008, we launched a campaign called Tell General Mills to Put a Lid on It. It was an email-based campaign and web-based campaign where we asked people to write to General Mills and, and explain why they needed to stop using RBGH if they were gonna d do breast cancer stuff. And lo and behold, they did. And that is the power of activism. That's when ordinary people do a simple thing, like send an email, or write a letter, or send a postcard, it changes the world. How do you like your coffee, Sharon? With cream, please. I've been having such a tough time these days with the stock market the way it is. John and I have been shifting our investments to healthcare companies. We just bought some shares of the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly. 
they make breast cancer drugs both to treat the disease and reduce the risk of people getting it. Did you know Eli Lilly also makes RBGH? RBGH? What's that? It's a synthetic hormone given to dairy cows. They sell it under the name Pauzolac. It increases the risk of cancer in people who drink milk made from cows treated with it. In fact, companies like General Mills and Walmart have stopped using milk made with RBGH in their products. And Canada and the European Union have even banned it. That's probably why Monsanto sold it to Eli Lilly in the first place. So Eli Lilly is making profits from cancer drugs and a substance that could increase the risk of people getting cancer? Yeah. So Eli Lilly is milking cancer. When you start looking at who um, is, is actually controlling science, it goes all the way back, I think, to you know who has the money. Um, a lot of the research that's being done is being done by the pharmaceutical companies. They, are, they also fund research that they think is going to be in their interest to fund. Um, AstraZeneca, for example, which is based in the UK, produces tamoxifen. As far as I know, it still has the, the patent on it, and uh, it's making billions of dollars a year. Tamoxifen is anti-estrogenic. It's used as a treatment for breast cancer to stop estrogen production. They also own Syngenta, a uh, pesticide-producing company that makes atrazine. Atrazine is very, very widely used on corn um, and on a number of other crops. It's been used widely in North America, right here in Essex County. Atrazine has been found to be estrogenic. In fact, it's been banned in Europe for use because of its endocrine disrupting um, uh, characteristics. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which has a very nefarious history. It was invented in the early 80s by a public relations expert at Zeneca in, New, in uh, Delaware, which was the American arm of what was then the largest chemical company in the world. And this month certainly encourages women right. and men to talk about the issue, what kinds of things are being planned? Uh, organizations all over the country involved with breast cancer and cancer concerns are planning something nearly every day. One notable is National Mammography Day on October 19th, where over 1,700 radiologists are participating with uh, free mammography for women. And, and that's exciting. That's, that's a big breakthrough. I think it'll encourage people to have not had that first mammogram go get it. You talk about the importance of corporations getting involved and there's no better example than Zeneca yes. Pharmaceuticals. Bob, tell me what Zeneca is doing and why. Well, we've had a very strong interest in breast cancer for a number of years because we are a, a research-based pharmaceutical company. We do basic uh, pharmaceutical research into cancer. We realize that early detection is extremely important to the long-term survivability of patients. In 1985, we were one of the founding sponsors for National Breast Cancer Week in those days, which has now turned into National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, because we wanted to try to get the message out to uh, women across to America uh, that early detection really is very important. The point of Breast Cancer Awareness Month since, since its inception has been to promote mammography as the major tool in winning the fight against breast cancer. And all promotional materials that use the name must be approved by AstraZeneca. So what we have is a situation in which a company that will benefit from more people being diagnosed with breast cancer through the use of mammography, producing a campaign, encouraging people to get screened. Oh, 
enfants, nos, nos soeurs, ça. pour nos mères, pour nos tantes, pour nos oui, amis, pour nos enfants. Quatre infirmières qui marchent pour la vie. Merci. Merci. I think on the part of the people who are walking the race, that is really innocent. You know, people just don't know. We do trust, and why wouldn't we? And, you know, I think a lot of us feel really frustrated in the month of October because, okay, great, we're getting this recognition. But at the same time, it's almost like our disease is being used for people to profit. And that's not okay. It's not, um, there's no integrity. For people to finally rise up and object, people have to know. They have to be aware of the magnitude of the lies they're being fed. And the lies are comforting lies. People are not going to want to give up these lies. They are comforting. Breast Cancer Awareness Month is comforting because you're doing something about something that scares you. Breast Cancer Awareness Month, despite the fact that it does not reflect any reality, works. Pink ribbon vacuum cleaners work. Pink ribbon teddy bears sell. Pink ribbon yogurt also sells. It works. And as long as it works, they're going to keep pushing it. Thank you. And it is tempting to say they must be in a conspiracy, but that's way too easy. I wish it were, because if it were a conspiracy, then we could expose it and suddenly people would be aware. But it's not. It's business as usual. We need, uh, you know, as. Uh, corporate uh, citizens, we obviously would love that uh, the rest of the corporate world uh, do give back uh, to the communities uh, in this manner. We look at our position as being that of, of a leader to raise funds. That's our job. We take that job very seriously. And when we listen to the researchers tell us about their job, we need to raise a lot more money. That's right. The notion that the solution to a complex problem is throwing money at it is a typical American solution to a problem. I don't know if it's just American, it's capitalist. If we just throw enough money at something, we'll understand it. I think that is so wrongheaded. For one thing, I think, I, 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 I hear at many meetings now, well, breast cancer is so complex, there are no simple answers. The more we invest ourselves in complexity, the harder it is to find new answers. Can we take a step back and actually get some coordination of this problem? Does the person in the lab in San Diego know what the person in the lab in Montreal is doing or the person in the lab in Berlin? Are they coordinated? Are they duplicating? Are they doing the same things that failed three times? What is going on? Take, for example, um, trying to study the genetics of breast cancer in women of African ancestry. And we found out that, in fact, while we've had this large established infrastructure to study breast cancer, and a lot of groups have been funded, uh, when the genome-wide association studies, when the results started coming back, coming out, it turned out that every study upon study is all been among white women in Western Europe or in America. And so all of the data, no one could say for sure whether they apply to minority groups, to Asian women, to African-American women, to women in Africa. And yet we've spent millions of dollars studying the same population because these are the convenient samples, I call them. You know, white women go to doctors. They are in major academic medical centers are set up in areas where they can set up cohorts of well-educated white women. The lack of coordination in breast cancer research is appalling. 
At the federal level in the U.S., there are 30-some different agencies led by the NCI that fund breast cancer research. There are a number of nonprofits, Sue Loves Group, Komen Foundation, ACS, and there are tons of them. I mean, everybody's raising money for research because people want to fund research. And then there are the private pharmaceutical companies, and we don't know what they're spending. And nobody's minding the store. So what you see is all this money flooding into the cores. You see endless repetition of particular kinds of research. So research, for instance, that seeks to find incremental changes in life expectancy of a mouse given a certain cancer drug. So you get the needless repetition and then you get massive gaps. So questions about what kinds of cancers metastasize, right, which is what kills people generally, not the size of the tumor. That kind of research isn't funded. We must expand our reach country by country, town by town, village by village, person by person. In recent years, we've seen the development on the part of organizations like the Avon Foundation, the Komen Foundation, the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca to do breast cancer fundraising and awareness campaigns overseas. So this is what we can think of as the globalization of the breast cancer movement. What I found in my research is that what they're actually doing is producing a culture of breast cancer risk in places where breast cancer may not be a or the primary health concern. Basically, now we're going to take the same dumb messages to other parts of the world. We're going to so let me tell you a story about mammogram machines. In the early 70s, we were using, in, the, in North America, machines that gave very high doses of radiation. And we figured out that was not a good idea, so we stopped. What do you think we did with those machines? We sent them to developing countries. We, we do it all the time. We send the worst of our stuff to other places. And I would say that sending the more dumb messages all over the world isn't going to help. Companies need a license to operate. There are many, many competitors. Companies go into new markets. For example, going into China or India. In China, for example, the government wants to know, what are you doing for my people? What are you doing for my communities? Even before they're allowed to do business. When you give back through a cause, you earn the license to operate. Towards the end of the Bush administration, the U.S. government began using breast cancer awareness as a tool of diplomacy in the Middle East as a way they thought of winning the hearts and minds of Middle Easterners who are uh, angry at 
U.S. involvement, the invasion of Iraq, so on and so forth. And to me, this is the most insidious use of breast cancer awareness, but it's also not surprising. Until we in the breast cancer community and in the cancer community have the equivalent of antiretroviral drugs, until we have the, the ability to be able to treat this disease much the way that diabetes is treated, until we have those kinds, and even after that, um, evolutions in this disease, there's not enough pink. There's not enough pink. Hello, San Francisco Walkers! You have come a long way since yesterday morning, but now you are done! The research, the caring, the life-saving work being done across this country and around the world is all possible because of people like you. You didn't choose to stay home this weekend. You chose to take a stand, and we thank you so much for being in it to end it with us. We began here yesterday as a diverse group from 46 states who share a common thread in the fight against breast cancer. And even though you're now standing right back where you started, you are in a very different place. You are now part of a community, a community deeply connected to each other and to the cause. We'd like to demonstrate the strength of that community now and ask your family and friends to join us. If you are connected to this community because you are a breast cancer survivor, please raise your hands high above your head and hold them there. If you are connected to this community because you walked as far as you possibly could to raise funds and awareness, raise your hands and hold them there. Now reach up and grab the hands of those around you. Feel the strength of our connection, thousands strong, because we need each other to win this fight. We need the power of our community to save lives. But remember, our journey continues in three more cities this year and right back here in San Francisco in 2011. The fact that women are willing to walk, run, jump out of planes, climb mountains, shows how motivated women are to find the answer to breast cancer. We used to have a phrase that said, do something besides worry that might make a difference. I do think that the public, individuals, have enormous power if they would use it. When I see uh, a pink ribbon on a, the label of a product, for example, or even on somebody's uh, lapel, I, I feel uncomfortable. And if I have the time and the energy, I might even get into a, an argument and say, I know you're coming from a good place. I know you want to help. But I've been through breast cancer, and I don't think there's anything pretty and pink about it. When I see the pink ribbon, I see breast cancer. I see a movement. I see millions and millions of men and women coming together with companies, with government, with NGOs, with their detractors as well, stirring it up and saying, this is a disease that is too prevalent. This is a disease that has taken too many lives. This is a disease that we must stop and hopefully in the next lifetime. When I see a pink ribbon, I think I think the same thing of when I see made in China. It doesn't mean anything to me. I don't like the pink ribbon. I don't like pink. I think pink softens what's really not a soft disease. And I think that the pink ribbon makes breast cancer into something friendly and cuddly as opposed to a really yucky disease that's very scary and that has significant consequences. 
When I see the pink ribbon, pink is synonymous now with breast cancer, um, with funds that are raised for research on breast cancer, but really so much of that effort goes toward trying to treat the disease after it develops, and so little of it goes to helping identify and stomp out the root causes of breast cancer. Well, I'm sure that what I think of when I see a pink ribbon is not necessarily shared by other people. I see evil. I don't, I don't think of something when I see a pink ribbon. People often say, well, if it's raising money, or even if it isn't raising that much money, if it's raising awareness, like that can only be a good thing. And I have to disagree. I think that the level of misinformation and the perky uh, image of the disease is at this point doing more harm than good. <laughs>